welcome back. Time for this week's Capital Report with Pat McGuigan of CapitalBeatOK.com. Pat, you uh, recently wrote a piece on the Farm Bill and the effort specifically to block the return of the Cheyenne and Arapaho lands uh, in the state. Tell us more about this. It comes up every time there's a Farm Bill because there's this ancient argument over the land right at Fort Reno and around it, which is the legacy, if you will. It's a few thousand acres left over from hundreds of thousands of acres uh, that once belonged to the uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. And so every time there's a farm bill, uh, this uh, little agriculture research station there, grazing lands research station, is given another lease on life as the last remaining block uh, to returning that land. The problem is that the original agreements between the tribes and the U.S. government, and you've got to remember the uh, uh, treaties with the tribes are not only fundamental law, they're the equivalent of the Constitution because the relations between sovereign governments. So in any case, the promise was that if ever Fort Reno stopped being used as a military installation, that it would be returned to the two tribes, the Cheyenne and Arapaho. And there's been a various range of impediments, uh, national security findings, things that we can't get to because they're locked up in classified documents under the National Security Act, which mm -hmm. has been notorious for other reasons. So in any case, every time there's a farm bill, uh, members of the congressional delegation, members of Congress um, enact a new round of provisions to keep this little a ARS station going, which doesn't has been slated for closure more than once. So in any case, in the farm bill, as we get busy in the new year, that provision will be in there. There's plenty to fight about in the farm bill, and um, I'm basically encouraging them yeah. to uh, take that provision out and let nature take its course uh, to provide a little bit of justice for uh, law-abiding tribes in western Oklahoma and people who have some land coming to them that they haven't gotten yet. So that's my case. It's, uh, it's an interesting situation. There's a lot of tension around it, uh, but I kind of hope our government ultimately does the right thing. You uh, also wrote a commentary recently on the developing mayoral race here in Oklahoma City. How about some insights on that? Yeah, um, the status of that is a little bit of a moving target, but the bottom line is that the uh, state's largest newspaper has been seeking to force open uh, divorce records between uh, Councilman Ed Shadid and his wife, ex-wife Dina. Uh, both of them wanted those records sealed and they've reconciled as friends and are cooperating in raising their children. And I make a distinction between secrecy and government proceedings, uh, which I'm against. I'm a transparency guy and so is Ed Shadid. I make a distinction between secrecy and the natural desire for privacy that we all have. And I made an analogy in this piece to people might remember the Bork fight, which I often mm -hmm. talk about because it was such an important time in my life, where Bork's film records were stolen and leaked. And people were obviously hoping to find something salacious in those film rentals. Instead, all they found was he liked the Wild Bunch and a lot of uh, you know spaghetti westerns. Right. And as a result, some laws were passed called the Bork Laws to protect our privacy, you and me, to purchase or uh, record or view the films we want to f uh, view. So in any case, uh, out of that came the Bork Laws and uh, a reasonable zone of privacy people have a right to expect. And you have two divorced men running for mayor here, Ed Shadid on the one hand and Mick Cornette on the other. I'm not interested in their divorce. I'm interested in where they are now, and I think most people at Oklahoma City are interested in what their vision is for the future. But there's a pretty good chance that in the next few weeks we're going to find out a lot of things we don't necessarily have to know about both guys from yeah. quite a few years back. Yeah, you're right. Finally, all right, we don't have a lot of time. Do you, do you, uh, you want to take a minute to talk about the, uh, your participation in the Pew Research Center's uh, best and worst national reporting of the year? You were a judge. Yeah, it was uh, old Brent Bozell, who's an old friend, Media Research Center, and MRC does this every year. The only thing I'll say is that the winner was something I probably don't want to repeat uh, on broadcast air, although it was broadcast on right. MSNBC, and that's when Martin Bashir said just something absolutely dreadful uh, should be done to uh, Sarah Palin when she made an analogy between crushing debt and uh, slavery. 
and ultimately, after about two and a half weeks of raging controversy, he retired. Well, uh, he left MSNBC. So well, sure enough, that's the quote of that's the year. The, the others are pretty good, uh, including Thomas Friedman in the New York Times, a great writer, but he said very ill-advisedly that the best response to the Boston Marathon bombing would be to pass a carbon tax. Maybe the world is flat. Wow. Maybe. <laughs> and Merry Christmas. Yeah. Uh, thank you. You can read more about these and other con topics at uh, capitalbeatok.com. For Pat McGuigan, I'm Alex Cameron. Have a Merry Christmas.